welcome. Um, I'm Elizabeth Weingarten. I'm the Associate Director of New America's Global Gender Parity Initiative, which is a project of its breadwinning and caregiving program. Um, so welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for being here, and thank you so much to our partners, Radio Free Asia. Um, so today they are publishing an ebook called It's Not Okay. You can see these great signs in the background here. Um, and that ebook inspired this event, and we're going to uh, watch a quick video on it in a second. Um, and you should all really download this book as soon as you get out of here because it is fantastic. But this is a conversation that's important to have now for many other reasons. Um, of course, we're approaching International Women's Day um, in just a few days, uh, and it's a particularly big year for women and girls. You, I'm sure, all know that we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Hillary Clinton's uh, Beijing speech in 2015, um, where she said women's rights are human rights, of course. And we're also rethinking global policy frameworks um, as, uh, that support women and girls as the Millennium Development Goals uh, expire this year. So as we develop this roadmap for where we need to go next uh, in the gender parity movement, it's really more important than ever that we listen to the voices of women who are fighting these battles around the world. And we're going to hear some of those voices today. Um, so the disparities, of course, that we see are huge in Southeast Asia. And it's one of many regions of the world where we're seeing this uh, really backslide in not only rights for women, but rights for all people. Um, so we're going to hear, as I said today, about some of the uh, battles that women activists are fighting. Um, and we're also going to hear about their unique struggles as uh, female leaders in conservative societies where they're pressured to remain at home voiceless. Um, so first, we're going to watch this quick video, and then I'm going to invite um, my guests up on stage. The role of women in human rights struggles in China and Southeast Asia is absolutely pivotal. Take a look, for instance, at the women who are leading the Bunkak uh, land struggles in central Phnom Penh. They have faced police and military, they faced blockades, they faced intimidation by thugs, all to essentially assert their rights to a home, fair livelihoods, education, and services for their children. Their husbands, fathers sent to the camp of re education. The women have to suffer the same ordeals. They all of a sudden become so isolated in so many ways, repressed in so many ways. And that's where courage is born, because they then have to stand up. Women are not naturally seen in many parts of these societies as natural leaders. So they have to work twice as hard, in some cases, than the men. You know, she didn't expect in her life to become an advocate either for him or for broader issues. She has the courage to stand up to the generals when nobody dared to speak against them. When you have a principled, uh, intelligent, and courageous woman rights leader, uh, this is the sort of person that the government of Vietnam fears and wants to lock away. But nowadays, they've realized that the world is paying attention. And with the support network from outside, they also gain more courage in speaking out. So first, just want to make a, a few introductions here to the very um, wonderful people that I have sitting beside me. Um, first, joined by Zinmar Ong. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, um, with Zin's work, but she is a Burmese civil society activist um, and a um, former prisoner of conscience in, in Burma. She was arrested in 1998 for peacefully protesting against Burma's military government. And she was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Um, after she was suddenly released in 2009, she founded the Yangon School of Political Science and also uh, Rainfall, which is a Yangon-based uh, organization that empowers women in Burma through human rights trainings and awareness building. Um, and in 2012, um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, gave her the International Women of Courage Award, um, which is very, um, a very huge award. 
Uh, and then I'm also joined by um, Dr. Bin Yen. Um, she is assistant professor of radiology of, uh, for medical institutions, including Johns Hopkins, uh, the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and um, the uniformed services of the University of Health Services, Health Sciences, excuse me. She's the president of the International Committee to Support the Nonviolent Movement for Human Rights in Vietnam and the spokesperson of the Coalition for Human Rights in Asia. Um, she's also the chairman and founding member of the International Protection for Prisoners of Conscience. Um, and also, uh, Katrine Antoine is the director and managing editor of Radio Free Asia online and the executive producer of the ebook It's Not Okay. Um, and she has reported all, out, all over the world, um, in China, Southeast Asia, Indian, India, and Australia. So welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. Um, so Katrine, I was wondering if you could kick us off by telling us briefly, how did the book come about and why now? Sure. Um, a year ago, just about this time, because uh, you know we all have women on the mind around March 8, we were sort of brainstorming, thinking what what aspect of women's uh, status can we cover? And, and believe me, there are many, many issues affecting the lives of women in, in our target country in Southeast Asia and China. And it, it occurred to us that actually the sources of our stories were very, very often women who deserve to be uh, uh, brought forward. Um, you know, Radio Free Asia's mission mandates that we cover news and information that is censored in authoritarian countries. And our sources very often are the wives, the sisters, the mothers of lawyers or dissidents who are thrown into jail for their ideas. So we thought it was time that we bring light to what happened to these women because they pay a very, very high price. We speak about famous names, um, Liu Xiaobo, but we don't speak all that much about his wife. And she actually face up to just as much hardship, if not as much as he does. So um, it took a year because most of these uh, women are difficult to contact. In fact, some of them, uh, we lost contact since the beginning of the year, and unfortunately, um, uh, a fair number are either in jail or on house arrest and, um, and unreachable via the phone because very often our phone lines are, are intercepted. Um, but in essence, we wanted to pay tribute uh, to their courage and, and bring a focus uh, around this time of the year when we think about women to what their plight and what their fight is. Through the course of putting the book together, we, we became aware that, in fact, there is a lot we can do from outside to bring them support, to bring them information. There is, there is a lot of actors who have a role to play who could help their struggle. And maybe we're going to talk about it later. Yes, absolutely. We will, we will touch on that mm -hmm. um, a little bit later. And I also wanted to um, say that anytime, um, Ben or Zin, you want to jump in, you're more than welcome to. It's supposed to be a conversation. Um, so uh, as you say, we are thinking around this time of year about women. Um, we're thinking about kind of how far we've come in the past um, few years, in the past 20 years. Um, so on that note, Zin, I want to start with you and ask about uh, the changes that you've seen since the, um, uh, since the military government was dissolved in 2011 um, in Burma. Uh, I think there were a lot of hopes back then that that would lead, the democratic transition would lead to um, kind of an improvement of life for um, not only the women of Burma, but the people of Burma. Um, but yet today we've heard, um, I was just reading that the police appear to be stymieing a student led protest um, uh, against an academic policy, um, while at the same time, um, the Nor Lo Nor Nobel laureate and opposition leader, um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, is meeting with the current president. So there are a lot of things happening. Um, what should we make of all of this? And you know, do you believe that the political change has had any impact on, on the lives of uh, Burmese citizens? Um, it's a Big question, actually. To me, um, the very beginning of the transition, let's say liberalization, 
So we did hope a lot whether we, you know, our transition is leading to democratic transition. But the thing is that two year, two year after that, um, just liberalization is over, and we are not, you know, sure whether this transition is leading to democracy or another type of regime. Not quite sure yet. Since last year, one and a half years ago, we can see the emergence of the ultra nationalist movement that totally targeted, you know, to violate intentionally or intentionally the women human rights. So that is happening, and it might be happen in the future again. Before maybe, especially this year, we have the general election at the end of this year. Maybe the this ultra nationalist and religious will be manipulated in terms of political power, especially targeting to the women. So that is what currently happening. Of course, there are so many uh, issues like land rights issue, um, the re-arrest of the journalists, then student protests, you know, human rights activists are still under threat, and not just from the state, but also from the community. So that is quite different. In the past, we just only received threats from the, you know, states and government. Now, not just only from government, it's, government is quite clear. They don't necessarily need to violate our rights directly, but the emergence of the ultra nationalist group and identity group that, you know, not our target is not just only for government, but also even among our community, we still need to, uh, you know, confront or and compromise. It. Human rights cannot be compromised anymore, actually. So, but we, the, the, from different directions, the challenges are coming from. And you've now been in the U.S. for a while, um, but you're heading back there um, to Burma in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us kind of what's on your agenda when you get back? My agenda is I will continue what I was working with my two organizations, especially with Yen and uh, Yen people and women. So Yangu School of Political Science is closely working with uh, political empowerment for new generations. So providing the political science and human rights education. Then plus, we also engage with the emergence of this certain issue like ultra nationalist movement. How can we promote a peaceful coexist among different, uh, you know, diverse communities, something like that. Then we engage in election monitoring. We have the big issue, you know, constitutional amendment for people movement. So we engage this issue. So there are so many issues that we need to engage. So part of that, we have two programs. Education is long-term program. The second one is the engagement, political education and political engagement. That is what I'm doing with Yangon School of Political Science. Of course, on the other hand, along with rainfalls, romance groups. So based on my own experience, I came from the political backgrounds. I was arrested. So I saw so many uh, women who already engaged and sacrificed their life for the, you know, our country's changes, but their voices are still marginalized. Even women themselves internalized as a follower, supporters, not being able to get in, into the stage for leadership. So what I found out is that we need to empower and encourage those women who already have their potentials. We, of course, we need new, new generation. So we formed the Rainfall Gender Studies Group for Currently, my agenda is for women political empowerment, to get more women in politics, not just in parliament, but also each and every level study from voter list. So that is what I'm doing. Another agenda is I'm about to open the, uh, the center for youth in my own township, because the young people have been manipulated and misused by the emergence of ultra nationalist group because of lack of um, you know, um, job opportunities. It's a very poor economic situations. The young people already have their motivation, but they don't know how, you know, they have no, wh where do they go? So that's very easy to be manipulated by those groups. So that is what I'm targeting. Great. You know, Zin Mars has, work at, has her work cut out for her because only 4% of, of the parliament in Burma is made up of women. So y you have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ben, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, communism's impact on women because when you talk about kind of proportion of women in leadership positions, um, something that we've seen that's, that's very interesting is that part of communism's legacy in places like China and Russia, um, at least for a while, was 
um, to elevate women into senior leadership positions. So you have more women in senior positions in, in companies um, in particular than um, in the US, um, in, in China and Russia, for example. Uh, but at the same time, um, there was just a big story a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times about kind of the backslide of women's rights in, in China um, and you know the idea that this is kind of changing. Um, so, and of course, you know, Vietnam, where you are active, is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. There's stark income inequality. Um, and this is another big question, but what is your sense of how communism has helped and hurt women in Vietnam and, and perhaps in China? And what are some of the biggest challenges today? Um, first, I think it is a myth to believe that communism in any way assisted women's role in society. I think truly what it is, is it's using women's um, positions in mid-management um, positions in order to create the illusion that there is any conception of equality. Really is, if you look at it, the women who are put in these positions are not in any way having the ability nor the power to make final decisions. The Politburo in China or in Vietnam, where the final decisions are made, are comprised mainly of men. And therefore, they're using women in mid-management positions in order to manipulate the system because the women are easier and more docile in order to go along with their corruption, their policies. And therefore, it's, I truly believe that it, there is no true power to women in communism. Do either of you have thoughts? Yeah, you, in the book we interview a lady called Tong Yi. She's a former political prisoner uh, from China. She now lives in California. And she explains exactly the same thing. And she says, you know, just look today at uh, job posting in Chinese newspapers, and you will see any, any uh, job geared towards a woman will post the height you're supposed to have, even the looks you're supposed to have, your age, things that are totally appalling in our eyes. So in her, for her analysis for Chinese women, um, women have been more and more penalized actually in society through the um, present regime. The interesting thing though is in the movement for the activists in the countries, um, China, uh, Burma, Vietnam, um, etc. I think the women are realizing that they also have to really be in charge of their own destinies. And therefore, they have become a lot more vocal. Um, true that it is maybe early on during their struggles, they have a slight advantage in terms of not being bitten up on the street by the police force or the thugs hired by the police because that would be viewed very poorly towards the government. And so that might be a slight advantage in the beginning, but really, truly, along the way, they found their own strength, they found the unity among the women, and they were able to move forward with the cause or, you know, whether that's labor rights or land rights, religious rights, um, or women rights in general. And they found that community strength and bo bonded together and moved forward. And so if anything, we're observing this movement of more and more young female activists acting um, really more, a lot more aggressive and strongly against the government. They're able to speak out more. Um, they're not afraid of the government. And they're able to write communicate and, and reach out to the international governments more in order to, to show and to shed more lights on, the, on their plights and the struggle for human rights and dignity in these countries. What to you has fueled the rise of these kind of young female activists? Um, I think that um, as the younger generation, they have seen what their parents have gone through. Um, for example, if they've seen that their parents were put in jail, or uh, in my case in particular, my father um, was killed in prison in the camps of re-education. So that was one of the reasons why I started this journey. But along the way, I think what people realize is that as the young generation, they now have taken on the burden, the responsibility in order to change their path, in order to change their future. 
Um, they've seen how their parents were incapacitated by the government in many ways, and they don't want to have to suffer the same fate. And as young people, they realize that they have more power, they have more um, connection to the internet, and they are able to reach out to the international communities a lot more effectively as compared to their parents in the previous generation. And therefore, from that, they have felt the encouragement observing the, um, um, the Arab Spring, observing some potential change in Burma, people in Vietnam and in China are strongly encouraged. And I think uh, also the formation of the new middle class in some of these communist countries allow the young people the access that their parents didn't have before. And so that's another economic advantage that the young people now have as compared to their parents. Um, Katrine, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, social media and the impact that you saw in, the, in your interviews on um, the lives of some of these young female activists and how that may have played a role as well. Yes, it's, social media actually has changed um, the struggle uh, for human rights in a big way, particularly in Vietnam and Cambodia. I'm not so sure about Burma today, but I would be ready to bet that in a year or two, once mobile phones start penetrating much more widely, um, it will have um, an impact and it really helps them a great deal. We feature in the book one uh, Vietnamese lady who, a very interesting story, she was a victim of human trafficking in a sense. She was one of these many Vietnamese young girls who go overseas to earn a living and send the money back home to support their family. Well, while she was in Taiwan working in a, in a factory where she could barely keep her salary because her, her intermediary was holding her passport, keeping the money, you know, um, she had a road accident. Having a road accident in Taiwan, she ended up in the police station. And the Taiwanese, ironically, it's the Taiwanese police who opened her eyes on her situation and said, as a, as a worker, you have rights. And she became educated in Taiwan through her recovery, flew, went back to Vietnam eventually, and had by then become an advocate for labor rights in, in Vietnam. She's a very young lady. She's a mother of four kids. And she actually uses her cell phone constantly. And she will walk into a meeting with some officials, policemen or, or other kind of uh, officials, with her mobile phone on video. And she will shoot the video of the, of the meeting constantly. And you can see on YouTube her little video clips being reposted and reposted and reposted under anonymous names, of course. But the, when you bring them together, you watch and you think, this is an amazing person. She barely had an education. She became educated through what happened to her. And she now knows that you need to keep a record. And we have uh, a lot of situation very well documented because she goes into these confrontations because they end up being very violent. What's happening in Vietnam is dreadful, is that nowadays the police is not hesitating to beat up women very nastily with um, pipes, you know, and there is a video of her on a hospital bed. I think she has a broken arm, a broken leg, bruises all over the place. The babies, the two little babies are running behind the stretcher saying, Mama, Mama. She's trying to quiet the babies. She has, she's talking to the journalist at the same time. I mean, they, they end up in these situations that are absolutely horrifying. Yet it's on video. It's on YouTube. We can watch it. We can become educated. and and we have the proof of what's going on in Vietnam today. That's, that's a lot. Compared to what was happening 10 years ago, it's a lot. Has that led to a response from the international community or a, a meaningful response? Hmm. It's a very good question. I would say one of the responses would be this event today. <laughs> <laughs> I think that most embassies in Vietnam uh, from the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the European Union um, are quite aware of the situation in Vietnam it, to some extent. Maybe they don't have all the details nor all the information, but they do, um, they are informed. Um, they do reach out to these activists 
um, in terms of holding meetings, but these are always mostly interfered by the government in some way, whether it's a stage accident, some roadblocks, or quarantine the activists inside their homes so that the meetings wouldn't take place, or causing problems after the meetings have taken place by taking these folks up to have working sessions with the um, uh, security services. Um, so, and, and also the, the point about that having now more and more women being vocalized and very um, active in all fronts, whether again it's labor rights, land rights, religious rights, uh, journalism, and so forth, um, these women are now also being targeted uh, severely, just as their male co counterparts had been in the past. But the women are somehow f um, feeling that this is their rite of passage. This is what they need to do in order to stand up for their brothers, husbands, sisters, and so forth. And so they, they are standing up more and more. And so that is truly a new trend, at least in Vietnam. And I think that China is uh, it's also um, having the same impact. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask all of you whether you think that having support from particularly the United States and the U.S. government, is that something that helps or hinders activists? Because, of course, you know, in certain parts of the Middle East, for example, um, associating yourself with, with America or with Western policies absolutely does not help you. Um, so is that is it similar um, or how does that affect um, the work that, that you all do or that you, that you hear about? It's quite... Uh, supportive actually for me based on my own my experience in 2012 before I received the awards I didn't able to get my passport I have been denied you know to get passports not just only me but also all ex-political prisoners didn't allow to get passport didn't allow to go outside the country but along with the liberalizations and along with the you know American engagement so I, as soon as I re I received the information about that I was selected for these awards and whether I will go outside, you know, bummer and receive the awards. I'm not quite sure yet. Just before two or three days I left the country. I I'm not sure, but the I would like to appreciate the effort of the United States Embassy and political officer in Bummer in Rangoon. They continuously, restlessly, you know, um, you know, efforts to get my passport, then in last minutes I got my passport. But on the other hand, as soon as I arrived back, Bomber, the authority, you know, took back my passports. Okay, so then I then informed the you United States. Award, is what yes, you're <laughs> another award. And then I informed to this uh, embassy and state member, okay, my passport was, you know, like um, withdraw by the government. Okay, we will keep invite you, you know, so along with the the official invitation by the State Department. It's not just part of uh, their effort, but also kinds of coincidence. At the same time, the, our government would like to get external legitimacy from the outside government. You know, they didn't even get in the past, you know, so what they need is external legitimacy from the outside, especially Europe and the United States. It's part of that. So I was lucky enough. So now I got my passport in hand. But on the other hand, the student protests, you know, who, the student who engage in protests, now they don't get, they, they withdraw. They still struggle, the plane, you know. That's why our transition is still need to be questions, whether it's denying transitions or just plain they get, to, you know, yeah. to sustain their power, to get, you know, external legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think that having international, especially the U.S., um, um, I would say support um, in many ways, um, whether it's through uh, political pressure with the government or th direct assistance to the activists, um, it's extremely helpful. Um, I have to say, without a doubt, that is what has made the movement a lot stronger. And also the activists... Having, no, having the comfort of knowing that the U.S. and or the international communities are not abandoning them really gives them even more courage and more um, comfort in moving forward with their cause, you know, for their activism. Um, I have to say that some specific cases of folks who were jailed or are still imprisoned, having this international um, 
attention or awareness really helps their case. Either they are being released before their terms, um, such as in your case, and also, in addition, maybe while they're in jail, they are not as severely tortured um, as they would have been otherwise if they were not an, if they were unknown to the um, to the rest of the world. Um, having said that, uh, it's not always true for all the cases. Um, the Vietnamese government specifically would pick and choose which prisoners they would release for any particular reasons and which prisoners um, they would still keep. For example, one of the women who were also awarded uh, the, um, the Award of Courage from uh, Secretary Clinton, um, Mrs. Da Phong Tan, she's still in jail. She actually was a former policeman who then realized you know, how the system was wrong and how the women rights were violated. So she wrote a lot of blogs and that's how she was imprisoned. She's still in jail even though she received the award um, you know, from the State Department, uh, the recognition. So not all the cases are, um, um, are released early before their time. Um, so they, they do pick and choose because her voice is particularly um, powerful to the same um, comrades, meaning the police people um, in, um, in the forces. So if she were to be released early, then maybe in fact her influence would run deeper and would encourage more and more dis you know, descending voices from within the police force. And that's probably one of the reasons why they didn't release her early um, or haven't released her um, yet. Um, in other instances, um, people are allowed to go abroad, um, and so having the visa, if the international communities in interfere and, and um, supports for them to get the visas, they're able to travel abroad and bring their voices abroad, and so that's very helpful as well. So in general, the answer is yes. You know, we need a lot more international support. We need a lot more U.S. Um, support and also political pressure on the Vietnamese government in order to allow um, these voices to be heard and, and not to be um, beaten or put right or stifled or, or put in jail. And, and another thing that's very interesting is um, economic isolation. So what the government would do is not only do they imprison the activists, but they would also create severe hardship, economic hardship to the rest of the families um, of these folks, right? Right, and then so for that, that will decrease the amount of support that the, the, act, the actual activist has, but also the rest of the families would be somehow related and then will be um, punished, retributed in, you know, in economic sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a tactic that's common throughout all this authoritarian government in China. It's terrible. Um, in f there, we have two, two of the women featured in the book who are wives of um, people who are in prison because of their ideas and they have been ostracized, they lost their job, they can't find a new one, they don't have any means of support, they can't even stay in their home. It's, the, it's like it, it, there is a process to not only throw somebody in jail so nobody can listen to them anymore, but also oppress their family to you, you know, it's, it's an intimidation tactic. And it's, it's very common throughout all the countries. Then, did you have something to add? Or? So, yeah. like, for example, like the, in the past, for one of the women who live in, in, in Mendeley, so her and her family business is still occupied by the government under the title of you know, public property. She, she actively involved in democracy movement and her family also. So non, there are so many things that for economic, economically shut down by the government for those who actively involved in democracy and human rights movement in Burma also the same, mm -hmm. the same pattern. So, uh, you know, of course, as we talk about these women who are, who are um, uh, human rights activists, uh, it's clear that being a leader in the West is very, very different than being a leader in Vietnam or in Burma. But um, I'm curious to hear from all of you um, about whether you think that there are struggles that both women and the West, in the West and women um, in Southeast Asia face um, as female leaders. Um, so kind of are there, are there similar struggles that you see um, between the two groups? I saw it's uh, two categories. Like in here in the West, like politically much more Democrats, right? So I think in here, 
many women face like kinds of social barrier than political barrier, right? So for Obama, like Southeast Asia, many of our country are under the authoritarians. So not just socially, but also politically, we still need to you know, struggle. Double burden for us, I think so. Quite, but we can learn a lot from here. So networking, uh, you know, across the country, over, you know, women organization. I just visited West Coast. There are so many, you know, strong women organizations in Seattle, West Coast. So it very encourage, encouraging for those women who are working in the you know, developing country under the authoritarian regimes. So it's quite helpful by networking women across the you know, globe. Um, I think that, um, well, let's start with some differences um, in terms of um, education. In the, in, in the Western world, I think that women are more or less very much uh, on the same par as men in terms of achieving and having the same opportunities for education. I think within the past few years, for the first time, there are more women attending medical schools than males. You know, so that is something to show that now there is more equality um, the re uh, throughout the Western world uh, to some extent. Uh, there are still obviously some problems in terms of salaries and so forth, and, and we know that very well. But in, the, in these oppressed countries, in these closed societies, it's, uh, the situation is, is very bad for women. They do not have the same opportunities. Um, they might have um, up to 12th grades in terms of education. But other than that, beyond that, it's very challenging for these women to have the same kind of higher education or the same um, higher high-skilled jobs as, as men do. Uh, secondly, um, in the Asian culture, women are still burdened with having to care for the family and be the main person to care for children. And so that burden also diminishes the amount of opportunities that they're allowed to achieve or to acquire. Um, in addition, with the same culture, there is still that sense of repression for women in terms of what they're allowed to do. While they might be able to drive cars or um, ride bicycles, and so not to the same extent as in Saudi Arabia, however, there are still a lot of limitations in, in terms of what they're allowed to do in society and what can be, um, quote unquote, considered um, frowned upon or taboo for women to do. So um, from, from that extent, the women are restricted in many sense. As far as leadership, again, we go back to the same issue that we talked about. They're not truly in any leadership position per se. They may be put into a certain middle management position, but they do not make the final decisions. And most of the time, their suggestions or, or their proposals are turned down and or looked down, and they don't have the same kind of respect from their peer um, in most of the Asian um, countries, just from the cultural aspect. Um, on top of that, now you put the oppressive government. They do not view women as, um, you know, as people who could contribute freely to society, but they rather use them as tools in order to control the process. Because again, when we go back to some of the main issue with governance in these uh, oppressed countries, corruption is really is one of the critical issues, and and therefore, it is easier to have some women in some positions who then would be quiet and would not report the kind of um, through and through uh, corruption that we see in, in government, in at least these governments, in these corrupted governments of these oppressed societies. So I think that while there may be some minimal simil similarities between the Western world and the oppressed um, world uh, or countries, the majority of the time I think the gap is too wide. So that said, you know, I think a lot of times we seek to, um, or people seek to kind of learn lessons west to east or north to south, but um, are there lessons that um, Western female leaders can learn from perhaps not the formal women leaders that you speak of that don't have a lot of power, but are there kind of um, lessons that we can learn from the informal human rights activists um, that, Katrine, you know, you, you document their, their stories? I, I would say it's, it's hard to speak about lesson, but certainly I can tell you that it's enormously humbling um, for us living in our societies with a level of freedom we have and we don't think about it every day. 
um, when you read the stories of these women, some of them are extremely isolated. And the uh, courage that they display is, is um, uh, very humbling for us, you know. Uh, what they do, what they face up to is just amazing. Just so, for example, they can get justice. When one of the women featured is a mother whose son has been kidnapped and most likely sexually uh, molested during the kidnapping. She alone got her son back because the police didn't want to uh, listen to what she had to say. But she wanted justice for the fact that her son was sexually molested, and she didn't get it. Now she ended up in jail. She was jailed three times, and today she's still in jail. And you know, um, would I do this? Probably. I am a mother as well. But it, you know, you have to think about it. These are people who really, by themselves, in a context that's not our context, that's far harsher than what we experience. And, still have the human courage and dignity to stand up to abuse. And that is uh, remarkably humbling. And maybe we should just think about how fragile those rights are. It, that would be the lesson I would draw from this. And um, then do you find that, you know, as you've gone across the country and talked to um, a lot of women, um, you know, has the information sharing kind of gone both ways? Or what are ways that women have said to you, oh, I, I had no idea, or I, the, the things that you've said that other women have appreciated here? Yeah, they do appreciate what we are doing and struggling in Bomber and very much, you know, interested in how c can they help us how can we communicate to each other? How can we, we raise the voice of the voiceless in our country, like Bomber? For example, like many you know, of the land rights activists are women. Now they are in jail. And many of our you know, workers in industrial zones, they just simply ask for the minimum wages for you know, um, $30, 30 per month. They don't even get such amount of, you know, salary by doing the, such a horrible workplace in industrial zones. So they are just simply, you know, arrested and oppressed by those, the, you know, business men and you know, and responsible investment rights. Then plus the authority. So majority of those people are women. So I j can share the what are happening on the ground for those women like that. But on the other hand, of course, we do have some kinds of protection because of we are quite, you know, getting the media coverage and quite uh, noticed by the international community. So for the, what about for those who are voiceless? So we still need to have our responsibility to raise and to represent their voice also at the same time. So I can share those story with, you know, the women from here, so they will notice and somehow they can raise and they can notice this issue by doing, you know, and by raising their voice. So that is what we can do and that is the, the benefit of the working with other women across the you know, globe. Ben, do you have thoughts? Yes, I, I would agree completely that um, I feel part of what I do is really bringing the, um, the plight and the voices of the folks inside the country out to the international community. Because a lot of time it's very difficult and very challenging for them to do so. So that is really is my job, is to be their proxy, to be able to bring their plight and their struggles to the rest of the world and to share it with you like we're doing it today. Um, in addition, also to bring the kind of direct targeted um, support and assistance that they need. What do they need? They need computers, they need phones, they need um, access to internet, they need training. That's, these are the things that we do and we set up and we recruit and we support them with because with these tools um, they are able to go a lot further um, in their activism. So one of the things that um, we've seen here in the U.S. is that advocates for women are now 
frequently making uh, their arguments in a more creative way. So it's not necessarily um, we should do this because we want to help more women, but we should do this because it's a smarter business decision or because policy will be better with more women involved, um, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you find it harder as activists to frame your arguments now in, in, um, in the case of you know, it just being about women versus it being about the entire society? Or um, you know, do, you, do you find that um, your battles are, are more or less difficult if you frame them as fighting for women versus the entire population? Yes, yeah, still difficult. When we talk about women's rights and women issue, Nobody wants to join, even, even among the civil, the civil society organizations. But on the other hand, women organizations are very much active to engage in general issues, like not just only women issues. That is what uh, you know, we strategize. We are not just doing our women's rights. We are just also doing with our, for our whole community, our whole society. So it's, it's very challenging still. Well, I just talked with one, one of my Bombay's colleagues. Now she is in here to receive the International Woman of Courage Awards this year. So she was quite frustrated because, OK, our women's groups are ready to engage with each and every issue. For example, like education law, land rights, uh, constitutional reform, women's groups actively, even a peace process, peace uh, demonstrations, women's groups join. But on the other hand, what we are doing about women's rights, like uh, violence against women, something like that, just only women, right? Very few, you know, uh, civil society and very few men engaging. But we still need to work with it to persuade them, you know, you know, men advocates for women. So very few people. So that is what we are challenging. Even though we are doing not just only for women, but also for our society. But for us, society still hesitates to engage in women, you know, spoke out about women issue. Well, I'm not an activist, so I'm not <laughs> part of the group. Um, I, um, you know, it's funny, you mentioned the word creativity uh, earlier, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that when we put the book together, we wanted to give the profiles of these women, in, in, and they are all from a very wide background, and v a minority of the women actually fight for women's rights. They fight for land rights, they fight for labor rights, they fight for all kind of rights. Very few of them fight for really the place of women in society. But I just wanted to mention that we have illustrated the book in, in a quite a fabulous way. And I, I can say it without easy, any hesitation because the artists are over there and they don't belong to RFA, they belong to the Broadcasting Board of Governors. And we, it, it's part of our effort to bring in a certain amount of creativity to the message, if I can put it this way. So I encourage everybody to download the book and look, read the stories, but also look at the illustrations. They are quite fabulous. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't often get such colorful uh, um, yeah. posters up here. So <laughs> beautiful. Um, I think that when we uh, get into this journey um, fighting for human rights, universal rights, and democracy in these countries, it's really not just about the women. I think it's about every single citizen in any of these countries. And so just along the way, you find these women with terrible situations, and you do the best you can to help them. But it is in the bigger canvas of fighting for democracy and human rights in these countries. So it's not specific about the women, but the women are are becoming more and more of a stronger voice of the um, more um, active community um, of these activists. And therefore, we're helping them, we're assisting them in order to become even better at what they do in these countries. Um, and therefore, um, some of the activities we do out here are targeted at helping them. However, it is about the whole society, as you've said, Amzin. Um, so what can we um, in the U.S. and in the West generally do to be supporting these women more? Um, kind of what, what should be our um, agenda going forward? Um, I think that uh, a couple of things that we have been asking for and um, some of the things have already been implemented is to have these um, 
the uh, U UN uh, Human Rights Council rapporteurs to go visit um, these countries more often. We've got a few folks from the religious um, and also from um, the uh, uh, the handicap um, uh, rapporteurs to go visit Vietnam. But we need more. We need more people to come in to see the situation and to be able to make it even um, uh, more open to the rest of the world what kind of situations these women are facing. Um, secondly, um, we definitely need more training for these women. They need more high skill jobs. They need more opportunities open to them. And the kind of education that they receive need to be at a higher level than just through, through high school. And therefore, I think that by training a new workforce of women in these uh, oppressed societies would actually move the entire society forward. And so any, um, any framework that we can go um, to work with these governments in order to pressure them to create more opportunities for these women, that would be probably the best thing. Um, their labor rights have to be more respected. They have to be encouraged to, um, to take on classes, for example, for computer science, for engineering more, and, and allow them to hold higher um, high skill jobs. In, in society and earn um, higher pay, and also to have a better protection for their rights in terms of, um, uh, let's say, during um, labor or having um, time for time off for their children and so forth, and sick leaves. So these are the things that are not existent in these societies, you know, not like what we have here. So we we need to ask for those things for these women. Well, um, it's worth saying that we also have a long way to go when it comes to paternity leave and maternity leave and sick leave as well and vacation. Um, so, um, and then it's quite perfect, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize on the government to government advocacy and pressure is still important. And on the other hand, for the to to support the age bodies for the women's human rights groups on the ground. Of course, for if the investments are coming to get the gender priorities for in terms of getting jobs for the women, vocational trainees, you know, like said. So I just want to, to we like government to government advocacy is still important because the the many of authoritarian regime don't want to, you know, pay attention to their even own citizens because of power, right? They just wanted to talk to listen to the you know the powerful government <laughs> then their own citizens, some extent. So it's still important, government to government advocacy and pressure. Then help and reach out to the ground who are working with these, the, their own citizen, not government. Do government agency, you know, just only for, the, of course, they do have policy, just only on paper. They don't implement yet. They don't enforce this law. For example, like Bomber, so in 1997, they, um, they the, gov the Burmese military regime tried to be part of the ASEAN. So to be part of, to be the membership of the ASEAN, they still need to have gender agenda or priorities. So like that, so they just simply formed the government sponsor women organizations, the leading by the wives of the generals, you know, but they didn't do anything now. They, they already signed CEDAR, but they don't implement yet. So that, that's why we still need to empower and encourage, encourage women's group that counter in balancing the, the gungo like the government um, sponsors, the women's organizations. Uh, Asian, I think every country, like especially like in Southeast Asians, the so government already formed their own women organizations. But on the other hand, they still, these women's groups are still violating women's rights, right? <laughs> so that is what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what are though some of the successes that you think that you all have had? Because um, I think that you both have done amazing work, and you know a lot of women that have done um, really substantial work. So, what have been some of the bright spots of the past few years in terms of um, victories or steps forward? I think in Bamar, maybe in 2015, there will be more women participation in parliament. So that is what I hope in near future. That will be definitely. But the thing is, I, I'm quite cautious. Just only being a woman is not enough, right? Quant not only quantity. My focus is quantity, qual you know, representation to quality representation. Because of 
past experience recently, uh, a woman MP proposed anti interfaith marriage law. You know, extremist group target for those women MP, very conservative, but she, she proposed this law. It's quite, that's why, be careful. Just being a woman is not enough. She must be democratic and she must be, you know, <laughs> that's what I, my concerns. <laughs> so quality representation. That's, that's a good lesson, yeah. <laughs> um, and how, how, I'm just curious, how are you going about kind of the um, training and encouragement of, of more women to get involved in politics? What's your strategy? My strategy is less years. So I recruit the women from uh, political parties, civil society, and activist groups who are interested in politics. So on the other hand, for those women who are already engaged in politics, they don't have idea, they don't understand some gen gender. So the exchange like that. So my priority is that the empowering women, understanding in my society, whatever we, even though we are working or engaging in politics, we are very much afraid of talking about po power. So it's quite, you know, controversial and com conflict. So we need to talk about power if we, you know, would like to be part of politics. Power and politics, is in, you know, it's in separate, cannot be separate. So that's why we need, women need to, you know, have you know, brave enough to take power in their positions. So that is what we are encouraging. And on the other hand, they still, of course, they still need to have you know, skills you know, to be part of politics. So that is what I'm doing for 2015. So not just only for MP, but also for campaigning, women for women, you know, to raise the voter list if, as a you know, voter list campaigning and MP. So that is what I'm doing. Of course, we need to engage with, you know, women in business, that's when we can bridge politics and business still need to uh, work together. Um, I am not so optimistic in terms of any successes that we have achieved even within the past decade. Um, I think that things are getting worse. Um, we still have women who are being trafficked throughout Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, these women come from all of these countries, right? They come from Vietnam, they come from Cambodia, from um, Burma. Um, and so I don't see that getting any better. Um, and women are being trafficked under different forms where they're direct traffic into the sex labor, um, or they are being trafficked as brides, or they're being trafficked through um, very poorly waged um, jobs in um, these other countries. And so, I, I would like to see more improvement in that area, and we're trying our best to work with um, the TIPS uh, department, with uh, you know the State Department, in terms of giving their data and so forth. But on the ground, it's the education that we actually need to have with the society, right? We we need to educate young women more, and and unfortunately, these women are from the poor rural area who are disadvantaged, so they don't have the same kind of access to understand what kind of positions they were being traded into. Um, they feel sometimes that going abroad, getting married to someone, it's a way to help their families, or working at some factory jobs, let's say in, in Riyadh, it's, it's helping their family, but in turn, actually, it's actually hurting them and their families more, because not only are they themselves getting into this terrible situation, but even their own families can also be um, harassed with the kind of money uh, that either they earn or, or the government it's after the, the family. And so uh, I think that's one area that I would like to maybe focus a little bit more um, than what we have done in the past in order to raise even more awareness and also to stop the kind of trafficking that's going globally. Um, secondly, in terms of activism, I think the women um, in the country, while they're being more vocal and um, more uh, courageous to stand up, they're also now being targeted by the government specifically because for that reason. Um, secondly, I, I think that there is really no um, 
no end in sight in terms of the amount of oppression that, let's say, the Vietnamese government is putting on their citizens. So I'm not so optimistic that there is going to be an improvement, let's say, in 2015. Um, through some of the international uh, uh, treaties, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, we're focusing a lot more on labor issues in Vietnam. And recently, we were able to get one labor activist out of jail. And she was even able to travel um, to Europe and here to the United States to, again, bring her plight for um, the fight for labor rights inside Vietnam to Congress, to the State Department. So I accompanied her to these meetings and, and translate for her in order to, you know, to get her voice and her experience out. Um, so would, would I call that a highlight? I'm very happy for her that she was able to get out and she's able to um, raise the awareness um, to the level that she has, you know, this one person who is doing amazing thing, you know, a single individual. Um, but we like to see more of that. And that's just one case and that's just one situation out of thousands and thousands more. And so I'm not so optimistic. Um, and I'm not seeing where the Trans-Pacific Partnership is stating in terms of protecting the rights of these women, of these um, laborers inside these oppressed societies, because they're not even part of the conversation, right? Um, so again, that's another area that we could focus more in terms of, you know, with international treaties, where we can get these um, human rights issues incorporated within the greater framework of international treaties. Um, and, and I would like to go back to education. I think that's really is the foundation of improving society, in, in especially in these um, countries. And so how we can improve the, the institution of education in Vietnam, it's a major challenge. Um, um, have, have we seen any international treaty really be effective in any way on uh, any of these issues that we're talking about? Well, um, some of the um, conventions that the Vietnamese government has ratified through the UN, for example, against torture, uh, imprisonment, and so forth, now that they have ratified it, we have more of a tool in order to go to these um, government um, officials in order to raise the issues every time there is a case that's being violated. So if Vietnam and US has their um, annual human rights dialogue, then we can always bring these cases up. And now that they have ratified the, the convention um, against torture, then we can say, wait, you signed this treaty and you've agreed to abide by these terms and here are the cases that you've violated. What do you have to say? How will you, you know, change that? And so it's a step by step. You know, you, you use um, rule of law in order to fight against them, and you use conventional um, pathways through political pressures to work with these governments. But those are, you know, small steps, and you don't see the end results um, for a long time. So. Um, I want to explore something that you talked about a little bit earlier um, and we've all kind of been talking about, which is this, uh, this backslide of rights and you were saying things have been getting worse over the past decade. Um, why do you think that is? And again, I know this is a big question, but as we've seen you know, in the past couple of decades, on the one hand, this blossoming of women's rights groups around the world and um, you know, ostensibly this huge push for, for more women to be involved. And on the one hand, you've talked about how women leaders are just kind of in these um, uh, figurehead positions and they have no power. So, um, so we have that going on, but at the same time, uh, you know, some international pressure for, for more women's rights, but in the face of that, this backslide. So, so why do you think that is? Um, if, if I may sp uh, speak first, I think the global economy is one of the reasons why. Um, if we don't have the business communities buy in, into the issue and the struggle of human rights is going to be very challenging. Um, as global economy and you know crisscrossing of trades between countries, that advantage of um, of business and economy takes away the rights of the, the smaller people. 
And so until the business communities would say, I will not trade, I would not go in, for example, Cisco, right, in China, they actually went along with the Chinese government to suppress internet rights. And look at what's happened now, right? China's dropping Cisco. That's a huge lesson. If you work with these governments, sooner or later, you're not going to gain anything. If anything, you're just going to lose out. You have to stand with these, you know, against this government from day one and say, I will not work with you until you let we have these specific terms. You know, we cannot give up human rights in order to gain business advantage. And so this is a huge lesson. I, I believe that globalization is great. A lot of countries get you know, the doors open to, to more trading and finance um, improvement. But the younger, the, not the younger, the, the, um, the small people lose out. And therefore, they're not part of the conversation. They're not part of the process. And until the business community say, we are invest in these countries, but we want to invest in the people. We want to be there in the long run. We want to help the people improve in addition to improvement of finance and the bottom line of the, com of the companies. Mm -hmm. Until then, we are just going to see the economy of worsening rights, and then more and more people have to stand up for themselves, including the women. In terms of the cause, you know, you have to also think regionally and the impact of the one-child policy in China is enormous. Um, I think China is going to add, um, it was in the next 10 years, the equivalent of the population of Saudi Arabia. Bring, these are new young men coming in into the marriage, a, marrying age and it's having a huge impact on, on this terrible trade of brides. And, you know, it's not the primary purpose of the book, but it's an underlying issue, and it's it's only getting worse. In fact, our next it took us a year to put this book together, but our next big project is to come back to the issue of human trafficking. Uh, we've done it already, but we will. We things are getting worse in this area, and um, and, and that has a lot of impact. You know. Yeah, I absolutely agree with your idea because the country like Burma is a developing country. When we struggle on democracy and human rights, and then there, there, there was an, another issue. Okay, we need to, you know, get much more business than human rights and democracy. Business is much more important, economics especially. Economics is more important than democracy or not something like that. Such kinds of idea is quite... Uh, you know, heated debate in, in Burma. So when we talk about democracy and human rights, something like, okay, I just wanted to bridge these two issues without freedom of, you know, expression, without rule of law, without, you know, freedom of, uh, you know, uh, you know, association, something like that. How can we operate business? How can we regulate economics? So that is why, you know, what we need to bridge between the economic development and the, 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 Protections and promotions of human rights and democratic principles that should come together. If not, so because we do have, for example, like the unresponsive investments, that's right a lot, already that's right in our country, our neighboring country, like in name China investment, there's no, you know, responsible for our country and people just simply engage with the regime. So the benefits, where, where are the benefits? Just go to the elites, cronies, and government and military, not go to the, our own citizens. So that's why, so we need to bridge and come together, the responsive investments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm sure you all have some okay, in the back there. And just wait till you get the mic, if you could introduce yourself as well. Yes, my question is, uh, what is the role of the Shan and the Rohingya? I'm, I'm Joel Hetker, I'm retired. In Burma. Okay. So it's, the issue has not just emerged recently. Actually, that's already exists under the age of the military regime. So it's not just their identity issue, but also the, our citizenship issue and rule of law issue. It's, I think it takes time. In terms of Rohingya issue, it's quite sensitive and heated issue as a politician, especially for the Democrats. Even I, when I talk about the title Rohingya, it's quite controversial. I will be definitely attacked in my country, actually, the, the, you know, from the extremist group. The thing is that 
we do need to realize that it's a problem that we need to be solved. We need to recognize this issue is to be solved the, in modern way, like, you know. So for the Xi'an issue, it's still fighting on, we're still very, very confused, not just only Xi'an, but also in Kachin State, we have, you know, civil war fighting against uh, the ethnic armies. So the thing is that we urgently need to have a roadmap for national reconciliations leading by the, the ruling party and the military. So the, both sides, each and every side, need to have the political will to get in, you know, the better solution for that. If not just blaming and talking about certain ethnicity, certain religious is not enough to solve the, the issue, the, 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 the entire national reconciliation process. All right, um, right there in the green. Hi, my name is Iris Shaw from Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, our country has, has been gone through the similar path not, not so long ago. Uh, two of the prominent political prisoners were uh, later on become the vice president of Taiwan and uh, one is now the uh, the most popular mayor of Taiwan's uh, second largest city. And our woman parliamentary position participation now is 33.6 percent. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is, is there any uh, uh, coalition uh, among the Asian countries that has gone through a similar path? Uh, I don't know whether certain coalition, official coalitions or not, but I do have some kinds of networking women from Cambodia and like Malaysia. We now the Burmese political situation is a bit open, and there are so many women forums, international women's forum, like that in higher level. So we do have. But on the other hand, like the similar representation in, in Burma, like three point something of like women representation. So what we are doing is that now I think the opening door for those women getting into the parliament is political party. I think if political party have the gender priorities to be part of the MP, something like that. We can promote, you know, the, the representation of women in parliament. Not formally, but informally we do have the, you know, networking among Asian women. But we still need to strengthen this network. Um, right there. Yeah, hi, my name's Kyle Hollick. Um, I have a question and it may be fairly Cambodia specific, but I think, and land rights specific, but I think it can, it can extrapolate it to other Southeast Asian countries. Um, I used to live in Phnom Penh, and I did my thesis on land rights. And um, of course, people who are aware of what's going on in Phnom Penh, you're, you know the Bangkok Lake protests, and I, there was even a shot of Tet Van A and Yombo Pa on the introductory um, segment. And um, if you've attended protests in Phnom Penh, and it's immediately apparent that the vast majority of the protesters are women maybe 80, 90 percent, excluding monks who show up in support. And um, this is very deliberate. I'll try to keep it short, sorry. This is very deliberate because um, the women are less likely to be violently abused or tortured comparatively with the men. Um, and, you know, these women have become like heroes, especially social media to other the younger generation coming up. But the thing is, the ability they are able to leverage conservative ideals to protect themselves. The reason they're not li less likely to be abused or tortured is because of their second class status in society. So I'm wondering if, if, if you see that as problematic or going forward, like how can that be alleviated? Because if these women, uh, you know, if they, if they uh, are viewed as equal as men, that means they're no, that's because they're no longer viewed as like uh, less intelligent or uh, this traditional role and that opens them up to further physical abuse for example I hope that's clear <laughs> it, it, it's a long question um, but my my I'm sorry <laughs> my inclination would you know I'm not an expert again I just report on this uh, situation uh, number one uh, women it's true the cultural setup is such that there will be some hesitation on the part of the police to be harsh uh, towards a woman, uh, but that's not going to last very long. 
And um, we've seen it in Cambodia. Look, you have an example of somebody who spent 11 years in jail in a, in a terrible circumstance. So women are not spared. Um, and, and you know what? I, I suppose they use what they can use. If today the status of women is such that they are a little protected and speak up more, well, good, because if they obtain some attention on their issues and some form of resolution, like they have gotten some success in, in this particular case, good. You know, um, people on the ground use whatever they have within their cultural context. I don't see any problem with it, honestly. You have to be very pragmatic. Yeah. Um, I think they need to be more organized. Um, they need to have leadership. And they have to have more training in terms of even as basic as techniques, how to protest, and how to protest efficiently, and how to um, demand you know, in, in the ways that they would get what they demand for. And so I think that what we're doing now is we're trying to help with some of the activists in terms of bringing them out of the country and train them on the tools and techniques of rallies, of protesting, of leadership, of organizing, and that's what they need. These, a lot of these people are able to protest because one, they're women, they may not have jobs, so the men go to work and the women have a little bit more time to do that. And then thirdly, they may not be educated, as you say. So in order to galvanize this kind of force, this kind of movement, they need to have some form of organizing leadership and, and some, some structure to what they do. That's the way to, to <coughs> alleviate and improve the situation. Other, other questions? Um, in the back there. Oh, hi, I'm Nancy Tang from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I have a question about Myanmar's upcoming election and how women's rights and human rights are going to fit into the discussion and how, uh, whether NLD or USDP will have a um, different approach to it. And I also have an additional question out of personal interest in terms of um, the crackdown of, on freedom of speech in China. I was wondering how that would impact um, feminists and activists on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, in 2015 election, what uh, I think the the as I said as I said before, the citizen participations, especially the women participations in these elections, each and every process, starting from the voter educations, that is uh, what we can do, and other civil society are doing, and also in terms of human rights, especially I think in that case, rather than it's more appropriate what we talk about the electoral laws, so ele the how the election committee behave and engage with different political parties. So it's much more, I think, relevant than directly talking about human rights and the other women's rights. Uh, of course, maybe human rights election related violence might be happen before 2015 election, especially based on the uh, ultra nationalist movements and religions, I think that if some of our women's leader, you know, the you know, engage in politics, they will be much more targeted than others men. So that is quite different. The, there's much more challenge ahead of the women rights activists for 2015 elections. In terms of China, um, oh, yes. I mean, there is no <laughs> doubt that the crackdown on speech right now is, is a, a huge um, impediment and problem. Um, we've lost, as I mentioned, um, to start with, we've lost contact with some of the women that we, we could still reach via the phone. Several months ago, we lost contact. We just can't even speak to them or their families. It, it, it's a huge problem. It, I, if I may, it just makes the work of RFA all the more valuable because we are the only one who can continue publishing information and news on this situation because the people living inside China just cannot. Mm -hmm. um. you another question right here. Hi. Um, oh, one sec, just wait for the mic. Hi, Kaylin. Um, and this is a question for all three panelists, although it might be targeted towards Mazima Aung. So Mazima Aung, you, s you had said that 
you are trying to give a voice to the youth amidst all of these manipulations in the country. And while I think it's so admirable, I want to know how you're able to do this, just because I think culturally speaking in Southeast Asia, um, the youth are dismissed very easily, especially young women in general. Um, and I say this because you know, I've heard popular um, sermons by Buddhist monks in which they say, even if your mother is wrong, your mother is right. Even though your father is wrong, your father is right. You're not allowed to question the elders, even though you know that they're wrong. And so, you know, as a Burmese woman, young, I would say fairly relatively young, <laughs> um, you know, you hear a lot of things and you just let it go. And it's very difficult because you grow up in America and you hear differently. And so, you know, I've always had this question on how do you empower youth when culturally there's something wrong within their country. So I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, the only word is that we should promote critical thinking. <coughs> we just based on my own experience, like I, I have same experience like you. For example, like I, my father and mother, but I used to question. I think need to be rebellious in some extent to ask the questions, to you know, you know, questioning the existing social norms are, are really, really relevant to human nature. So that is what we need to promote: human nature plus critical thinking. So that's why we need to to reform our education system. So before we can able to reform this system, that is what I am doing, providing alternative education for those young people, you know, building and forming, you know, civil society, especially based on civic education, promoting critical thinking, debating skills. That doesn't mean we do not respect our elders, our you know, senior generation. That doesn't mean like that. Just simply, you know, question is as a human being, the critical thinking and I think re kinds of rebellious is part of our human nature. I think we need to promote and understand much more in human nature also because our human nature has been oppressed under the traditional you know, doctrine. So we need to question and need to rebellious, critical thinking, alternative education. That might be my answer. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. Um, hi, uh, I'm Vera. I'm at the International Women's Media Foundation. Um, uh, there was just this article published this morning by The Guardian um, on um, a filmmaker who uh, just produced a film called India's Daughter about the brutal gang rape of the woman in India who was, you know, her intestines were pulled out and such and such. And um, in the article, <coughs> there was a quote by the defense lawyer of the four young men. And he referenced the culture of India and said that we are the best culture in our culture. There is no place for a woman. And so um, I am a Malaysian citizen. And um, one of the things that um, we have seen, especially when women are leaders, like for us, we have our Ambiga Srinivasan. Uh, she's the Berse Red. Berse is like our electoral reform um, protest rally leader, and she has been protested against. Like men have gone, like men have gone to her house and basically like done rude things outside her house, and you know basically disrespect her. And she's a woman of power. And so my question is, what? Um, what is the influence of um, the systems and sometimes elite men's attitudes towards women in power, or women who are wanting to gain power for other women? And um, what can be done to counter this, in your opinion? Um, I would say that um, it's, <laughs> it's a very challenging road. I think we're still facing the same issue anywhere in the world with the same exact issue. Um, <laughs> Getting to the similarity <laughs> part, I guess. <laughs> yes. um, I think that um, there are probably many approaches that women can take. Um, first is to prove your own um, strength, capacity, and ability. If you have proven track records of what you're capable of doing and you have results to, pr to back up of, you know, of the capabilities, 
then that is something that people can judge you on in terms of what they can see. And so while men may disrespect um, an elect, a female um, elect person, but they cannot um, disregard her track records. Let's say she has done, she has accomplished something or she has done something that's good for the people, for her constituents. So I think to, to use actions uh, in terms of counteracting the kind of behavior and deep rooted cultural um, misconception against women. So I think um, first you have to prove your own worth. Um, secondly, I think that having more and more um, awareness and educating people uh, in terms of um, literature, readings, you know, journalism, um, popular culture, uh, media. So use any sort of educational tools in order to let the public have an, a more open-minded um, awareness of what the rest of the world is doing, not just what Vietnam is doing, not just what you know, Malaysia or, or Burma is doing, but what's the role of women for the rest of the world and what other cultures view women and whether it's a, a religious bias or cultural bias. So I, I think having that kind of, of interaction and exposure to global um, awareness would help with countries where it's still a closed society or even oppressed societies. So I think media education has a huge role in opening the public awareness and gaining public um, support will eventually bridge that gap. So we're not there yet, even here in this country, but in other countries, by opening that door, maybe it will decrease the amount of misconception. Um, and so I think a lot of it stems from the lack of education, not just you know like going to school education, but the kind of knowledge and awareness that people have about what the role of women is and how women can contribute to society. So I think, I think that in a lot of countries where um, it's still uh, the majority of the people in the rural area are not well educated, not well read, it's easier to spread the kind of misconception in order to, you know, to, to abuse women. Um, so I think those are the two, at least two approaches. As far as back to your question about young people, it's a similar situation. Um, the young people are quite capable. They have to prove to the elders of what their capabilities are. And so while they may be abused by the, the elders in terms of saying, well, I'm older and so you don't really know since I have a lot more experience, but if you prove that you're capable of doing something, then the elders will have to have another look. For example, if you're you know, very fast out of computers and they're not, then immediately you're gonna gain their trust because then they're gonna to come to you and ask you to do things that they're not able to do. So step by step, um, rather than make it a struggle between the youth and the older, really more in terms of how to incorporate between the two. And so for my particular generation, we're a bridge generation and that's what I view myself as, how to bridge between my parents and and the younger generation who may be a little, not as young as my children, but you know, in between, because I'm able to speak both languages and I'm able to understand the problems and the issues and, and the philosophy of the elders. And yet I live here, so I'm, I've been raised here, so I understand exactly what the young people like you are going through. And it's the bridging between the two generations in order to help to emphasize the experience and also to elevate the kind of capabilities of the young and bring together in order to make you know the community a better place. So I think that is probably the best approach. Instead of making it like you know like this, you really kind of bring people together and say, okay, so the elder people have the experience. You will show us the pitfalls, you know, uh, and certain things and give us advice. But we young people, we are capable of doing this, and we're going to move forward and. And communities or society is not going to improve if the young people are not allowed to have the space um, and their um, and the ability to to basically bring society along with them. And and so I think the older people realize that it's just a matter of pride. And if you approach them in a different manner, it's probably going to make it easier. Last, last 
Mm -hmm. thoughts? Yes. I do agree and really support your your thoughts. It's quite, you know, even in minimal approach, it's quite useful practically. I just wanted to appreciate you. I'm <laughs> really, I just well, saying what you said. <laughs> On that positive note, <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all um, for being here as well. And you really have no excuse not to go and download the book because it is free. So I hope you'll all do that. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you.